thank you for having me at Dittany Davos in Switzerland. I wish I could be with you in person as I've been in Amsterdam and Bucharest uh, and Gibraltar and, and many other wonderful Dittany conferences. Today I want to talk about some of the consequences of exponential technologies intersecting with decentralization. As the founder and managing partner of Network Society Ventures, this is where we invest, helping startups achieve their full potential through uh, our injection of capital, but also through the organization and delivery of their token sales, uh, together with uh, Network Society Lab, uh, our advisory company. Moore's Law has been a self-fulfilling prophecy for over 50 years, allowing thousands and thousands of engineers all over the world to compete in order to achieve the next breakthrough that will bring from uh, transistors to integrated circuits, from uh, integrated circuits to uh, soon quantum computers, um, maintaining the promise of doubling the computational power um, that we have available every 18 months or so. This is not a natural law, but they have been able to keep working at it and without any guarantee delivering the results magnificently. Today we live in a world that is shaped by these trends and we are seeing these kinds of doublings with different timelines, with different baselines in many, many industries. Whether it is solar photovoltaics or the uh, price per uh, kilowatt hour of energy stored in a battery, um, these are also uh, becoming more and more inexpensive at a rapidly, at an exponentially decreasing rate. Manufacturing, where the speed, the um, ability to print uh, at ever finer uh, feature sets of 3D printers with various materials uh, in uh, uh, food production, in healthcare, in learning, in security. Um, these are just some of the sectors where we are looking at the power of exponential technologies. But these are also sectors that are characterized by decentralization. That is because contrary to uh, oil and hydrocarbon fuel sources, for example, sun is available at varying degrees everywhere uh, on the planet. Simultaneously, with these changing trends, we are also seeing better and better algorithms becoming more and more capable of analyzing huge amounts of data and deriving smart conclusions from them. Neural networks have an almost unreasonable power uh, in turning raw data into actionable conclusions. And whether this is classifying automatically your photos in your online uh, storage, where today I can run a query like um, people smiling at sunset on a beach, and I know that uh, out of the almost 200,000 photos stored, um, I will get the results, even if I didn't for sure label those photos myself by hand, whether it is uh, in the musical recommendation systems, whether it is some more uh, corporate-oriented, enterprise-oriented applications, artificial intelligence is underlying more and more uh, sectors of the economy. 
it needs to uh, become a part of the standard tool set of any project that wants to be able to compete. To the point that there are people who believe that AI and automation and robots are going to replace both manual and intellectual labor. And this replacement is going to come at a speed that exceeds the generational adaptability of human beings. Obviously, somebody growing up with a mobile phone will have no problem using a mobile phone because it will feel natural to them. But someone who has been driving a truck his or her entire life, there are now two million people whose full-time job is a truck driver in the United States of America. Their median age is 54. They've been each driving a truck for 30 years on average. Well, once trucks become self-driving, whether individually or maybe in a convoy of 10 trucks where only one of them will have a human driver uh, at lead and every other following them automatically, the standard answer, don't worry, just adapt, become a web designer, become a Java programmer. It is really cruel because the percentage of the people who are going to be able to adapt at the rapid pace required is going to be minuscule. As a consequence, a lot of people feel that the social contract is coming under pressure, that we have to rethink the current equation. If you work, you are valuable. You can only be a member of society if you are valuable. If you don't work, you are not valuable and you cannot be a member of society. More or less explicitly, this is the social contract today. There are those who believe that we will have something that uh, they call a universal basic income. But this very easily um, triggers um, kind of a syllogism uh, in the minds of the people who listen. A universal, unconditional basic income cannot be the consequence of not doing anything because income is generated through useful work. So they see the entire concept as meaningless and impractical. What I want is to propose an alternative terminology that plays the mind trick on the listener to immediately be able and buy into uh, the concept. And this comes from the very simple observation that we have not only work generating income, but we also have assets generating income. Those people who retire because they don't have to work anymore, uh, their uh, real estate investments, their um, uh, index fund uh, um, uh, holdings, uh, or other kind of uh, yield annuity generating um, assets generate whatever they need to, uh, to, to live, well, those people are fortunate. And what I posit is that we have to restructure society so that people can be driven by their passion, by their creativity, by 
investing their time, the most precious resource they have, to pursue those things and achieve fulfillment in their lives, but that the robotic, slave-like toiling in jobs that they don't identify with, but they found themselves doing because of either their geographical place of birth or because of their upbringing or because of just sheer luck or lack of luck, should become a thing of the past. So rather than talking about universal basic income, we should start talking about universal basic wealth. In a natural ecosystem, nobody asks a tree its value. The tree exists as part of that ecosystem. In a globally interconnected mind space of 7.5 billion individuals on planet Earth, in the technosphere that we are now building, that encompasses not only the biosphere, but is now extending in space, that is implementing, creating things that are impossible for biology, but we can dream and then realize. Every individual has a value. And it is the value of enabling everybody else to exist simultaneously. Many blockchains use mining to secure the network, but some of them, such as Ethereum, are aiming to move to a staking algorithm rather than a mining algorithm. When you stake your tokens, your Ether, you secure the network and by this act of staking your tokens, you are generating a return. Your assets yield an annuity. You are also part of a staking algorithm encompassing human civilization. You belong to it and you have a stake in it performing. And by staking your very existence in the capacity of human civilization, supporting you and supporting your dreams, you deserve to participate in the yield that globally this human civilization provides. This is what universal basic wealth is going to be. Our recognition through technological support from artificial intelligence, from blockchain, from solar photovoltaics and many other uh, intersecting, collaborating fields that we are able to build the 21st century civilization to build our dreams, to go beyond, to have everybody have a stake and have a part in it. Thank you very much.